So next let's have a look at what happens if our robot can translate and rotate. So here's now the setting. We still have a polygonal robot, polygonal obstacles. The robot now can translate and rotate. So this is our robot. It can now also rotate and still translate. The obstacles don't move and we're still in 2D. I will more give you the high level ideas of, of how to handle this case. You will see that if we would actually want to handle that case um, in particular exactly, it um, is actually quite complex. So here's an example where we actually would need rotations to be able to move this shape. Let's say here's the start, here's the end. Um, and the only way to get around this corner is to actually rotate. And likewise, the other corners. So here we need rotations if we want to move from start to go. What is the configuration space now? The configuration space. So this is my this is my robot. I can still translate it in two directions. But I have one more degree of freedom because I can rotate. So the configuration space is x, y for the translations and a rotation angle which is, means it's an R squared and then an angle. Now, how does the forbidden space of an obstacle look like? So the easiest way to imagine it is to look at the 2D slices of this forbidden space. If you fix the angle, for a fixed angle, this just looks like the forbidden space of translating robot, which is the Minkowski sum of the obstacle and the inverted robot. Now, if you move in the dimension of the rotations, it means that your robot slightly rotates and then you get the forbidden space of that slightly or the inverted slightly rotated robot and that obstacle. This construction, I mean, if you kind of think of it slice by slice, it will look like something like this here. So you get, yeah, get that shape. It's a very nice, video that illustrates this and I will uh, provide the link. It's also here. And here that's how such such a space might look like. Here this is an example of, of uh, those two objects. Of course um, these kind of fairly complicated algebraic surfaces are difficult to deal with. So a very simple approach to still compute this is the following. We simply take horizontal slices of the configuration space and then try to glue those together. That means we discretize the space of rotations. So we have the robot in one direction and then instead of continuously rotating him, the robot, we have a discretized space. If we now want to have the roadmap, what we want to do or what we can do is we compute for each slice, we compute a roadmap and then we connect the slices. Okay, computing the world map, we simply use trapezoidal decompos uh, vertical decomposition, and we've seen that. To connect two slices, we need to do the following. We're going to compute the overlay of the two, two slices, and then every cell, for every joint cell, so which is kind of a cell of gi minus one, and let's say this is a cell of gi. So for everything that is in the intersection, I'm going to add an edge from the one slice to the next slice. Meaning between two slices in the in the intersection of two cells, I for, for those two cells I have an edge so that I can move up to the next slice. Yeah, so that's it. Is this correct? Obviously as such not quite. And we might have two types of errors. So first of all, and this is a more dangerous error, uh, the following might happen. I might have um, two slices where in the overlay I see an intersection. But then if I connect them, actually in between, so, so let's say I connected these two because they, they are, there's a cell in the overlay, but the rotation would actually bump into something. So it's free in this, it's free here, but going up I would bump into an obstacle and that would potentially destroy my robot. So this error we definitely want to avoid. And okay, let's 
talk about that in a moment. Here's a other error that might happen. So first we had an error where there is no no path, or at least that path doesn't exist, um, but we thought it was there. Here we have an error where there is a path, but because of the discretization, if if this alpha is not one of the angles that I checked and this robot exactly fits for that alpha, then I have no chance of actually fitting my robot through this corridor. And this is very difficult to avoid if there's exactly one angle where it could fit. I mean, then our only chance is to actually kind of work with the algebraic method. As soon as there's slightly wiggle room, I'll be able to do it with um, sufficient approximation. Okay, but the first error, that one we really want to avoid. So how can we do that? We can do that by slightly enlarging the robot to make sure that if I'm connecting those slices, that then the robot actually fits. So if I make sure, if I slightly enlarge the robots in a way that the, this part is included, then I would find out that there is an obstacle. And I would see that in one of the two slices. So far, so good. That's what I wanted to say about rotations. Yet another question in terms of uh, motion planning. Let's say I have a robot. And I don't want to simply move it between obstacles, but I always want, I want to keep the distance to the obstacles as large as possible. Meaning if it's moving between two obstacles, it should be really moving in the middle. For simplicity, let's start with a setting where robot and obstacles are disks. Yeah, so my robot is a disk, my obstacle here is also a disk, and all other obstacles too. Which of the concepts that we know can we use in this setting? Vertical decompositions, Voronoi diagrams, or line arrangements. It is indeed Voronoi diagrams because I can simply compute the Voronoi diagrams or diagram of the obstacles and use that to compute my roadmap. Obviously, obstacles so far weren't disks in our setting. So what is, happens if obstacles aren't disks? We can use the same idea, but now we will have to compute the Voronoi diagram of line set. That somehow somewhat looks like this. If I have a line segments, I can still compute the Voronoi diagram. So this is the cell of all points that has this line segment as close as line segment. So I can still compute a Voronoi diagram and uh, the algorithm is in the book. And then I can still use that Voronoi diagram for motion plan. This video was mostly about rotations. I also handled one uh, other case, namely this middle case, middle path case. And now we are going to look at uh, the setting where we actually want to compute shortest path. We've seen that when we use a vertical decomposition, we don't actually get the shortest path. Um, and now we're going to see how we can get shortest path using visibility graphs. For this, the, this ob the following lemma or observation is kind of the key observation. If I want to find the shortest path from S, to t, then it will be a polygonal curve consisting of, okay, it will start at s, it will enter t, and all other vertices, all other intermediate vertices will be vertices of the obstacles. How can we see that? So let's say this is a path from s to t, not yet the shortest path. I mean, imagine pulling that, if this is kind of a rope, pulling it uh, tight, then it will at some point touch the obstacles and eventually look like this. So any path that does not use only the vertices of the obstacles and of course T and S itself, I can make it, you could say, shorter by pulling or kind of the idea of the proof would be the following. If, first of all, if the path is not polygonal, so if it has a curved path, then I can find a small corner here which does not contain a vertex if I now instead make it polygonal by connecting these directly, it will be shorter than that part up there. Of course, the straight, the shortest path from this vertex, from this point to that point, is a straight line. Then, beyond that, assume it is polygonal, but the vertex is not a vertical a vertex of the obstacle. Then I can do the same trick, making it shorter. Therefore, this cannot now have been the shortest path. Therefore, the shortest path has to use only vertices that are vertices of obstacles. Okay, so 
With this in mind, what we now essentially just need is we need to have the connection between vertices of obstacles because if I have all of these connections and then also connect S and T, then I know the shortest path will be in that graph. So let's say I have these polygons, obstacles, and the vertex set. Then, okay, here we have the vertices. Then we're going to define the visibility graph as a graph on the vertices of my polygons. And I have an edge if and only if those two points vertices see each other. And see each other means that the line segment between those two does not intersect any other polygon or any polygon. So for instance, there's no edge from here to let's say that one because here I'm first intersecting that polygon before I, I can actually reach. And this is a weighted graph and the weight of an edge is simply the length of the line segment. And once more, C means the edge does not intersect the union where we were taking the polygons as open polygons. So it's okay if an edge aligns with the boundary of a polygon because these are open shapes. And then the graph that we're actually going to consider is a graph where we take um, S, or I mean the set that we're going to consider is S and the points S and T. And then the visibility graph is simply the one where additionally to the edges that we have above, we also take all edges from S and T to all the vertices that S and T can see. And now the shortest path from S to T is the shortest path in this graph. And that is simply the case because we already know that the shortest path from S to T has only vertices of the polygons as intermediate vertices. Beyond that is polygonal. And obviously all the edges are actually edges between vertices that can see each other. Otherwise they would go through polygon interiors. With this, it's easy, or at least conceptually easy, to compute shortest path. Namely, in the following way, we compute the visibility graph, we set the weight to the length of the line segment, and then we're going to use any shortest path algorithm on that graph. We have positive weights, so we can use Dijkstra's algorithm and find the shortest path from S to T in this way. So what is the running time of this? So let's say, let's say n is a number of vertices, m is a number of edges in the visibility graph. Okay, we assign weights to edges, that's order m. We will use Dijkstra's algorithm to compute shortest path. That is n log n, n log n plus m. So far, so good. Now, the difficult part is computing the visibility graph. Now I would check for every edge here where that intersects. And if I find one, okay, there's no edge here. If I find one as here, then it's not a visibility graph. Meaning I'm taking n squared pairs, checking it with n edges. So naively I would take n cubed time. We can do faster, uh, do this faster, and we can do that actually with a fairly easy sweep line algorithm or sweep line type algorithm. So let's say I have a point, some point here, let's say this point here. I want to compute all vertices that are visible from that point. So that's my scenario. I have a point, I have polygons, I want to compute every vertex that is visible. So that this one back here is not visible and so on. How fast can I do this? order n log n time, order n squared time, or order n squared log n time. So what we do here is a rotational sweep. So we start in some direction, do a rotational sweep, and in this way we can do this in n log n time. So we have linear number of events, need um, log n time per event. This will give us n log n time. We do this for every vertex of our obstacles. We have n of those. So this will give us n squared log n, and that then also dominates our running time. So we can compute a shortest collision-free path from S to T 
in n squared log n time. Now we've computed the visibility graph that would allow us already to compute the shortest path from a point robot uh, start to its goal. If we now have polygonal robots, we can simply do what we previously did, meaning we start with a workspace, we compute the forbidden spaces or the new union of the forbidden spaces. Use that, use the visibility graph then there, and in that way um, can compute for a convex polygonal translating robot of constant complexity, a uh, shortest path in n squared log n time. So what have we seen overall? We've seen roadmaps and how to compute them using vertical decompositions. Uh, we've seen visibility graphs to then compute shortest path. We've also briefly mentioned how to use Voronoi diagrams for middle path. That's all for today. Today I only showed you this robot here, which cannot actually move. Previously in class, we demonstrated all of these concepts also using the epochs that we have. Um, there's also a short video that shows that, so if you'd like to enjoy um, beyond that, until next time.